Tonight in Las Vegas, such a meeting between Julio Cesar Chavez and Meldrick Taylor. Both are 140-pound champions. Chavez, WBC super lightweight titleist, is regarded by many as the best fighter in the world. Taylor reigns as the IBF's junior welterweight champ and is seen as one of boxing's most exciting competitors. Neither man has ever suffered a ring defeat. Chavez, who has won at least 66 consecutive professional fights, has the longest win streak of any active fighter. Add Taylor's 24 victories and one draw, and these two warriors are undefeated in 91 bouts. And under pressure, both have risen to the occasion. Taylor's career best performance was in his first title fight against then champion Buddy McGurk. Chavez has been tested 16 times in championship fights. 16 times he has willed himself to victory. But they differ in style. One is active, averaging 85 punches per round. Meldrick Taylor suffocates opponents with rapid fire flurry attacks. The other is accurate. Chavez lands at least half his punches, utilizing a sculptor's approach, chiseling away until each rock finally crumbles. These are the requisite elements of an unforgettable prize fight. Tonight, we bring you the unification of the 140-pound weight division between WBC titleist Julio Cesar Chavez and the IBF champion Meldrick Taylor. Tonight, World Championship Boxing comes to you live from the Las Vegas Hilton, where HBO Sports presents a 140-pound title fight unification between two undefeated champions, the IBF's Meldrick Taylor and the WBC's Julio Cesar Chavez. Live in the indoor arena at the Las Vegas Hilton, which seats 9,300, which has been the scene of some of Julio Cesar Chavez's greatest victories and toughest challenges, and has a crowd tonight populated by so many Mexican-Americans, you might begin to wonder whether St. Patrick's Day is a Latin American holiday, a crowd whose participation in this fight will weigh heavily in the favor of Julio Cesar Chavez. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. It's our great pleasure at HBO Sports to bring you what we call and what other experts have called the greatest little fight money can buy, a bout between two extraordinarily talented undefeated champions whose styles seem to be perfect foils for one another. As we turn to our HBO boxing analyst, Larry Merchant, it's worth noting that despite Buster Douglas's big upset over Mike Tyson in, uh, in February, which was a big surprise, we had been looking forward to this bout for a long, long time. And both fighters are aware of the expectations. Could the bout collapse a little bit under the weight of all this excitement? Following Tyson and Douglas is like Holmes following Ali or Norville following Pauly. In Tokyo, Tyson and Douglas were supposed to be a little fast food sushi and happily it turned into a four-star banquet. This fight is supposed to be a four-star banquet, so we might be disappointed if it turns out to be a little less. It's so appetizing because Chavez is one of the toughest fighters you'll ever see and Taylor is given a good chance to end his 10-year winning streak. If ever there was a reason for great expectations, this is it. And of course, for all of those reasons, Larry, people within the sport have talked about this fight and looked forward to it for a long time and have filtered through their memories to find comparisons with past fights of historic significance. One of them, which pops up, is the first fight between Roberto Duran and Ray Leonard in Montreal in 1980. There were similarities, Ray, between Duran at that stage of his career and Julio Cesar Chavez. There were parallels between you at that stage of your career and an undefeated Meldrick Taylor. And what happened to you is that amid all of that excitement, you wound up fighting Duran's fight. Could that happen to Meldrick Taylor tonight? Well, Jim, there is a parallel with Meldrick Taylor and myself because I've come to believe that sometimes the aura of the fight, the anticipate of the event itself, can be just as tough as the opponent. And for Melcher Taylor to be effective, he must concentrate. Concentration will be the key tonight. He must not allow himself to get tough and try to exchange punch for punch 
with Chavez. You spent a good deal of time with Meldrick yesterday afternoon. What's your uh, expectation of his frame of mind coming into the room? Jimmy appears to be very, very relaxed, very, very confident. But I tell you what, action speaks louder than words. We're going to see it very shortly. Of course, another bout to which this one has been compared is another that took place within the past decade. The first matchup between Alexis Arguello and Aaron Pryor. Here now, a closer look at the two undefeated champions and this great matchup. Tonight's fight is the climax toward which Meldrick Taylor and Julio Cesar Chavez have been working for the past two years. One of them will keep rising toward the pinnacle of the sport. Though he's won three titles and 66 consecutive fights, Chavez remains an aspiring superstar. Limited to the Spanish language, he's still a relative unknown outside his native Mexico. And on his behalf, Don King has fostered promotional campaigns and a brief attempt at an education in English. I must win this fight in order to achieve worldwide recognition and to fight a champion like Meldrick Taylor and defeat him will help me achieve my goal. Meldrick Taylor was one of the less heralded Olympic boxing champions of 1984. Fewer fans noticed his march to a gold medal than, for instance, the exploits of Breland and Biggs. But Taylor has since become the most successful of the 84 Olympians. The Philadelphia native won the junior welterweight title in only his 21st pro fight. This is a good opportunity for me to show the world that I'm, I'm the best fighter out there at 23 pound for pound in the world. In a sport where contrasting styles make great fights, these two champions are perfect foils. Chavez likes to fight inside, where he combines body punching with excellent defense to wear down his opponents and break their will. Meldrick Taylor relies on lightning speed and classic footwork to get off ahead of his opponents. I have the quick hand speed, good lateral movement, good mobility. I see Chavez as a great pressure fighter, good combination, relentless fighter. But I see me offsetting that attack. Boxing fans saw a similar matchup of junior welterweights seven and a half years ago. The Nicaraguan champion Alexis Arguello was like Chavez, a ring technician who held titles in several different weight classes. Aaron Pryor was like Taylor an undefeated American champion who needed a major victory to propel him to worldwide recognition. There were two fighters that were the best in their weight class and they feel they had different type of styles. Like this time here with me and Chavez for the 90s, we have um, two young fighters with a, a whole career, a life is on the line here, and we're going up against each other. Pryor and Arguello put their boxing lives on the line for 14 brutal rounds in an epic battle of wills. supposed to fight because we love the sport and we like the challenge is what it feels to defeat another human being with the same brain capacity with the same boxing skill you know and then you become the winner that's the great thing desperate determination is what made prior Arguello won a ring classic and what may make this fight a carbon copy especially since Chavez has come so far without ever tasting defeat I've always had in my mind that in the ring, every opponent is a champion, and I am a human being like anyone else, and one is always exposed to defeat. Fortunately, I've always prepared myself consciously 100% as each one of my fights leads to bigger and more important fights, and I think that's why I have remained undefeated. Meldrick Taylor has also benefited from a champion's desire. My will will probably prevail in this fight. Chavez is a great champion. He's determined. He has a lot of pride also. But I just think that extra little bit of will just to do anything it takes to win and just bring out the best. See, I'm a fighter that rises to the occasion. You know, if I have a, a challenge out there and somebody said I can't do it, can't do it, or I have just got doubts about me, I'm going to do it. No doubt about it, I'm going to do it. If Chavez and Taylor's confrontation is anywhere near as pulse quickening as the 1982 prior Arguello epic, fans will demand a rematch as they did for Pryor and Arguello just 10 months later. It's almost like deja vu. 
Only about 3,000 miles to the west. I went to the floor the third time and I felt that I was, I didn't want to get hurt. I said, I, I said my defeat, this, this man is better than I am. I called the referee, which is still uh, keep coming. Arguello never recaptured the champion's determination he lost in that 10th round. Pryor later relinquished his title and has since been treated for drug dependency. But past history poses no distraction to Taylor and Chavez. Youth, great rewards, and the spotlight of the present belong to them tonight. If I defeat Meldrick Taylor and the fight is not made with Hector Camacho, then I will move up and pursue a championship in the welterweight division. I'm at the beginning of the prime of my career, and I think I'm going to really excel in, in this fight. I'm going to propel me as the best fighter of pound for pound in the world. It's going to make me a superstar. Great fighters need great opponents to sharpen their edges. Chavez needs to defeat an American star like Taylor to achieve the recognition here he already enjoys in Mexico. Taylor needs to beat a Lionheart like Chavez if he wants to be boxing's next box office superstar. When champions meet, high drama usually follows. And now we bring you back live to the indoor arena at the Las Vegas Hilton where every seat is filled as HBO Sports brings you world championship boxing the 140-pound unification between Meldrick Taylor and Julio Cesar Chavez. It's scheduled for 12 rounds. And now once again, for more on this scintillating bout, HBO Sports boxing analyst Larry Merchant. True story. Years ago in Philadelphia, two hotheads came to blows on the job. And the Boxing Commission actually licensed them to settle it in a local fight club. Headlines in the Daily News told the story. First day, he called me a lousy bricklayer. Second day, he is a lousy bricklayer. The fight drew an overflow crowd and hundreds of telephone calls to the newspaper for the result. Why am I telling you this story now? And why am I telling you that since the 60s alone, 10 heavyweight and light heavyweight champions have either come from or trained in Philadelphia it's to impress upon you the breadth and the depth of the tradition that Meldrick Taylor represents and to suggest to you that if anyone can beat a fighter like Julio Cesar Chavez, it's a Philadelphia fighter, meaning a fighter with the will and the skill to survive its fabled gym wars. Meldrick Taylor is a gold medalist, a champion, undefeated, and what underlines those credentials is that he is a Philadelphia fighter. Now back to ringside, Jim. All right, Larry, a comparison in cultures between Philadelphia and Mexico, a contrast in styles. Chavez, the more precise puncher, he throws fewer punches per round but lands a greater percentage than does Taylor, who tends to overwhelm opponents with a lot of activity. Which style would have presented you with more problems in the ring, Ray? Well, Jim, the guy that throws less punches but land with more accuracy, and that's Chavez. Of course, there's always a chance, though, that judges will be more impressed by the fighter who throws a lot of punches, even if he isn't landing quite as many. You never know if it goes to 12 full rounds, which it could here in Las Vegas. Now quickly, Ray Leonard, your tips of the night for both fighters. Well, Jim, as usual, is speed, speed, speed for Melcher Taylor, but also good lateral movement. That's the key, to not let Chavez get set. Always moving, never being a stationary target. He must move in and out. He can't afford to slow down because Chavez, that's his fight. He likes to get inside and wear your body down. So what he must do is in and out. Use that good speed of his. And, and I'll tell you one thing, Chavez, well, Taylor is so quick, like here. Tremendous hand speed. So what Chavez needs to do is slow it down. And the best way to do that, Jim, is body shots. Work that body, slow that man down, get him in the corner, and take full advantage of that. But Chavez has a problem. He starts off too slow. And if he should do that and not be aggressive, he's going to find himself trailing on points. So Chavez needs to be aggressive and fight his fight. So that's a look at how those contrasting styles could play out in the ring. And right now, 
We await the entrance of the fighter with the fourth longest unbeaten streak at the start of his career of any fighter in professional boxing history. Julio Cesar Chavez records 66 wins and no losses according to our accounting. Most boxing authorities give him credit for 68 and 0, but we've been unable to substantiate the validity of two victories that are on Chavez's record from early in his career in Mexico. 9,300 people in the arena, and unofficially, Hilton officials suspected yesterday that as many as 75% of those tickets may have been sold to Mexican-Americans who can be expected to root for Chavez. I can assure you that there will be a little bit more noise tonight than there was from 30,000 fans in Tokyo for Tyson and Douglas. In fact, there was more noise at the weigh-in today than there was at that fight. And there you see perhaps the most impressive record of Chavez today, 16-0 in championship fights, far, far in, ex in excess of any other reigning champion. Mike Tyson was just beginning to get within range of that record when his unbeaten streak in championship fights was stopped in Tokyo. And there is another of the impressive Chavez statistics, fourth best streak without a loss in the history of the sport. And the other three who rank ahead of him were all fighters from back around the turn of the century. So in the past 50 years, no professional boxer has begun a career and sustained unbeaten success for as long as has Julio Cesar Chavez. Chavez is about an 11 to 5 favorite. A couple of hour, hours ago, the odds were down to about 8 and a half to 5. But a lot of these Mexican fans have put their money where their hearts and even where their heads are. Seating on the floor here is flat, so there are many who have not been able to see Chavez as he approached the ring. And now the noise will begin to swell as he enters the ring and comes within sight of most of the crowd. 56 knockouts among the 66 victories which we at HBO give him credit for. If you make it 68 and 0, it goes up to 58 knockouts. And none of Chavez's past 12 fights have gone the distance. Which is sort of amazing, Jim, because he's not a knockout puncher. And he's been moving up in weight class during those 12 fights. Unbeaten champions from present day boxing, and you can see none at 34 and 0 is a distant second to Chavez in terms of his unbeaten record. Virgil Hill up to 27 and 0 now. But it takes enormous consistency to win every time for as long as Chavez has been able to do it against quality opponents in three different weight classes. And now the familiar Lou Duva and his lieutenants will lead their charge, Meldrick Taylor, out of his dressing room. There is Lou filling the middle of the screen and screaming, where is the music? Right next to Taylor, that's Pernell Whitaker, world lightweight champion. Put the music on! Already things aren't going the way Lou wants them. All right, Lou, Lou Duva is happy now. Lou Duva is an emotional guy, and he makes emotions work for him with his fighters. They know he's backing them in, in every conceivable way. He is so animated that there's a tendency among casual fans to think of Lou sometimes as a bit of a buffoon. But don't let all the antics fool you. He knows what he's doing. You know what I find interesting is the fact that normally you walk to the ring, your song is always upbeat. But this song is very, Ray Charles, very, very slow. America! It's interesting, I tell you. <laughs> and carrying the American flag into the ring, is number one ranked heavyweight contender Evander Holyfield. An Olympic teammate. 
of Taylor's. Well, Holyfield holds the flag for his buddy, Meldrick Taylor. This fight will also get the rapt attention of Meldrick Taylor's other Olympic buddies, Mark Breland, Bernal Whitaker, Terrell Biggs, Virgil Hill. Pretty good graduating class. Not bad at all. Almost as good as the one you graduated from, Ray. It's been so long since I've forgotten, Larry. Well, Ray Leonard, of course, was a classmate of Howard Davis and the Spinks brothers in winning his gold medal at Montreal. And now we take a look at Meldrick Taylor's record, the only mild blemish, a draw with Howard Davis in what was probably the best performance of the latter stages of Howard Davis's career. And only the 12th professional fight of Taylor as well. He's had some big wins over Buddy McGirt, Robin Blake, more recently a tough fight with Courtney Hooper that was more of a challenge than most expected it to be, but he was coming off of a long layoff from a knee injury. Tail of the tape, the two fighters are almost identical in size. A one quarter pound weight advantage for Meldrick Taylor, a half inch height advantage for Julio Cesar Chavez, but basically they will present the same physical picture to each other in terms of well, size and dimension. Jim, Taylor is a little bit stronger. Taylor looks more, more like a welterweight, I think. Chavez a little bit more like a lightweight, but Chavez has shown real muscle def definition uh, in preparation for this fight, more so than we've seen him. Fun stat to statistics, Larry. And here is our statistical profile of how active these fighters are. And as you can see, Taylor throws a few more punches, but Chavez, who generally throws at close range, has a much higher percentage of success. Their styles also are reflected in the number of jabs they throw. Taylor throws more jabs. Chavez just pushes his jab out as an opportunity to get close to his opponent. Rules for the fight, combining the rules of the WBC, the IBF, and the state of Nevada. Three judges scoring on the 10-point must. No standing, standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. And you can be saved by the bell in the last round only. Right now, let's go up to the ring announcer, Chuck Hall, for the pre-fight introductions. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hilton Center of the Las Vegas Hilton Hotel, where tonight Don King Productions and Main Events Monitor Dan Duva President, in association with the Las Vegas Hilton, presents World Championship Boxing. This bout is sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Dr. James Nave, Chairman. The commissioners at ringside this evening are Dr. Elias Ghanem, Dwayne Ford, Jay Nady, and Luther Mack. The executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission is Chuck Minker. Representing the IBF at ringside this evening is Mr. Al Goodman, and representing the WBC at ringside is Mr. Bobby Lee of the state of Hawaii. The officials assigned by the governing bodies for the next bout of the evening, the judges will be Chuck Giampa, Jerry Roth, and Dave Moretti. The timekeeper will be Mike Morabito, Counting into the knockdowns, Al Bicek. The attending physicians at ringside, Drs. Flip Omansky, James Game, and Al Cabana. And your referee is Richard Steele. This is the main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the unification of the WBC IBF 140-pound championship. Introducing... In the red corner, fighting out of Culiacan, Mexico, weighing in at 139 and one half pounds, with a professional record of 66 wins, no defeats, with 56 KOs, he is the WBC Super Lightweight Champion of the World, Julio Cesar Chavez. And in the blue corner, fighting out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He weighed in at 139 and three quarter pounds. His professional record consists of 24 wins, no defeats, one draw with 14 KOs. He was a gold medalist in the 23rd Olympiad in Los Angeles. He is the current IBF junior welterweight champion of the world, Meldrick Taylor.
Okay, you guys, I spoke to both fighters in the dressing room. I'm cautioning again, tell them both to obey my commands at all times. All right? Watch the low blow, the rubber punches. Okay, shake hands. Good luck. The two things to watch right off the bat are Will Chavez come out faster than he normally does? Will Taylor be able to avoid serious exchanges? Let's go! Let's I'm so go. excited I could watch these guys fight Let's for go. three Let's straight go. days. <laughs> Through all of his training, Meldrick Taylor trained with a circle drawn in the middle of the ring. Lou Duba urged him to stay inside there and not go near the ropes. When he goes near the ropes, even if he may look good doing it, he is doing exactly what his corner won't want him to do. Well, they had what they call the zone, fight in the center of the ring, not allowing Chavez to corner him. So you should see a lot of movement from Taylor. Customarily, Chavez does not throw a lot of punches in round one, but he has promised, as Larry Merchant pointed out, to start faster this time. Tail's a little tight here, but I noticed where his punches come out. Came out, brother. They were not exactly smooth. Chavez scored with a left hook. A right in close by Chavez. But Taylor finished the exchange. This is the kind of fight that Chavez loves. That inside fighting. Likes to work the body. So what Taylor has to do is to maintain his boxing style. Just keep moving. Chavez's eyes are focused on the midriff of Meldrick Taylor. He is thinking body from the outset. Taylor with a left after he missed with a right to the body. For both fighters, the jab is a strategic rather than an offensive weapon. They're using it to set up other punches not to do damage or to score heavily. Good countering jab by Taylor as they finish that exchange. Chavez not really doing much. He's trying to see what Taylor has to offer. And then he, what he'll do, he'll pull on the attack. Taylor using his hand speed to land a little bit more frequently. One subtlety to watch if you have not seen Chavez before. He has extraordinary capacity to keep his eyes open inside and find targets amid heavy infighting. That's concentration. That's what it takes. Right hand lead by Chavez. Taylor flurries in return. You see the in and out movement from Taylor. Gets inside, throws combinations, and steps back out. Just That's what, what he needs prescribe. to do. Yep, just what you prescribed before the bout. So far, Chavez does not seem to have been markedly more busy than in past rounds one. Probably something that is just constitutionally difficult for him to do. Taylor starting with the jab. Chavez is using more right-hand leads. That was, a the left. that was a terrific round for Taylor. Well-disciplined round, and that's the key for him. He consistently beat Chavez to the punch. Let's hear Ruben Castillo tell us what's going on in Chavez's corner. Throw your right hand along. You better respond immediately. Two jabs, you go first. You, you, get a, you throw a good left hook. Work inside it. Don't get frustrated. Don't get excited. Yes, you have him in his belly. You understand? But just keep on making a little circle. Come on, now. Let's Give me a little more snap on that jab. A little more snap. Come on. The, the most alarming thing from Chavez's point of view in that round is that he didn't land enough body punches. He must land body punches to slow Taylor down 
so that he can come on in the second fight, in the second half of the fight. Round one was a very busy one for Meldrick Taylor. He threw 96 punches. They also instructed Taylor to snap that jab, bring it back, because you see the right hand of Chavez. He's trying to counter that jab. And it's difficult to do that if you throw two jabs. Chavez is still doing more looking than throwing. That's Not at all. Of, Jim, that's the kind of fight that's going to be good for Taylor. To frustrate Chavez. Make him look for him. Be cute. We've seen Chavez get off to this kind of start against much less talented fighters than Meldrick Taylor, though. He started slowly against Sammy Fuentes here in November. And Taylor finishing exchanges inside, using his hand speed. Some unorthodox targets. Trainer George Benton has urged Taylor to go for Chavez's shoulders and to hit him on the hip to distract him and throw off his rhythm. There he goes, hitting Chavez to the hip. The expectation of Taylor's camp is that he can get away with low blows to the side of Chavez's body. They trade a right and a left, and Taylor did more damage with his left hook. Taylor is bleeding in the mouth. Yep, it's dripping out from between his mouth guard. Good right hand inside by Chavez. The right hand of Taylor constantly drops. I think what's happening here is the fact that because he's been able to land so many punches in the first round, he's gotten a little comfortable here. And so far, Taylor has remembered to counter everything Chavez throws. How distracting could the little blood trickle out of the mouth be, right? Well, it bothers you because it has a tendency to, you know, to, uh, to just taste bad. Plus, it, it, it uh, hurts your hampers your uh, breathing. We've been told that Taylor had that cut inside his mouth during training. So it could be that an old cut has been reopened here. You see the right hand of Taylor, he's dropping it. Yep, and Chavez is throwing over the top of Taylor now, beginning to land with more consistency. Right hand leads, doing the damage for Chavez now. A solid left inside. And the crowd begins to heat up as Julio Cesar Chavez turns up the pressure. These are going to be hard uh, rounds to judge. Taylor control that fight until the la that round until the last 10 seconds. How do you score it? Too fast now. You understand what I'm saying, Dean? Now you ain't having no problem, are you? Now look, hey man, don't let him carry you so fast. You understand? The guy's carrying you too fast. He's backing you up too much. Hey man, you got to get down. Got to dig in a little bit. You understand what I'm saying, Dean? You? you listening to me? Huh? Now get under the seven of them punches, right? And start to jab him at his chest. Put that on back. All right, I got it. Okay. Okay. Ace. No. No. Keep that jab. Here's an exchange from early in the round. They're at close quarters. Chavez with a right. Taylor right back with a left. Well, for the first five minutes and 50 seconds, we watched a poised and confident Meldrick Taylor controlling the bout with his speed. But then in the last 10 seconds of round two, Julio Cesar Chavez began to penetrate his defenses. What you see here is actually... That was a slip, not a knockdown. A Chavez slip. is trying to... Well, he's dictating the tempo of the fight. He's making Taylor fight his fight at his tempo. a vicious right hand. Chavez seems unmoved by it. One of Chavez's extraordinary capacities is his ability to take a punch. And he has already taken some solid blows here. Ray, in that, in that combination, he did what you were talking about before. He threw three or four punches and then he got out of there. But they he didn't linger. That's true, Larry. That's, what, that's the key to the fight for Taylor, is get in and get back out. And not sit there and exchange punch for punch. 
because what happens also is it wears you down when you're inside like this. Chavez loves to get in close, body his opponent off, and fire the left hook. He did it successfully just about 10 seconds ago. Taylor still throwing far more punches. He threw more than twice as many punches as Chavez in round two. But typically, Chavez landed more than half of the blows he attempted. The surprise to me, Ray, so far is that Taylor has been landing many more body blows than Chavez. And that has been Chavez's most effective punch. And I tell you, that's Chavez's forte, the body shots. In fact, he's abandoned that, and he's trying to out-jab Meldrick. Because of his punch speed, out, Meldrick is starting and finishing most exchanges. This is another very good round for Meldrick Taylor. They're fighting in the zone in the middle of the ring. Chavez lands a solid right hand. But you see the frustration on Chavez's face. He can't get set. Now, whether or not Meldrick can keep up his tempo is yet to be seen. Meldrick trading uppercut for uppercut and landing more effectively than Chavez. Still boring in, coming straight forward against Taylor's flurries. A solid right hand at the bell for Julio Cesar Chavez, but it was another round in which Meldrick Taylor swarmed him with violent activity. Keep it going like that, you understand? Harold Letterman, our unofficial official, how do you see the fight? Larry, three to nothing, 30 to 27, favorite Meldrick Taylor based on clean punching. And for the life of me, I can't understand why Julio Cesar Chavez doesn't take a step to the right because Meldrick Taylor goes to the left all the time and Chavez doesn't cut the ring off. And I have the same score, although the second round could have been, could have gone either way. I'm a paratari. Stand there with him. Go punch for punch with him. Let's go. He, he doesn't have anything. Throw combinations. Go to throw a right hand. Throw a good right hand. We talked before this fight about Taylor allowing that Philadelphia fighter ego to get in the way of a disciplined fight. He stayed disciplined, and Chavez, it seems to me, Ray, is the one who has gone away from what his strength has been. And that's the body attack. In fact, it's very impressive with uh, Melvin Taylor thus far. He's been boxing, he's been moving in and out, and every so often he gets inside and throws a few punches. So if you expected the typical Julio Cesar Chavez slow start, maybe you've gotten that. Or maybe he simply hasn't been able to get started against the overwhelming activity of Meldrick Taylor. In the first three rounds, according to punch stat computations, Taylor has thrown 287 punches to only 116 for Chavez. Right hand lead by Taylor. Still trading four blows to one for Chavez. Chavez tries the left inside. Taylor comes right back. And Chavez simply hasn't been able to get Taylor to the ropes a single time. Taylor's combination inside is so fast, he can get him off and get away. But what happens sometimes, he has a tendency to stand up, and he's very vulnerable for a counter. But as long as he's moving, Jim, he won this fight fine fashion. Now get out. Solid left hand by Taylor and he moves back out. Another successful exchange. 
the promotion for the bout, Ray, called it thunder meets lightning. Lightning. And there was a good straight left by Chavez that snapped Taylor's head back. In that characterization, Chavez would be thunder and Taylor lightning. But there are a lot of people who think that Julio is not a powerful puncher up here at 140 pounds. Well, we'll see that. I mean, quite naturally, he's not been landing the kind of punch he's landed at, at the lighter division, but he still punch, plays so punches so well in there. He's been knocking people out, but not down. It's always been an accumulation of punches. So conditioning would be a factor here also. And to clarify what I said, Roger Mayweather and Sammy Fuentes ended their bouts on the stools in their corners, not flat on their backs on the canvas. Chavez simply wore them down. Watch your head. That's what he's going to have to hope to be able to do here against a Meldrick Taylor who in the first four rounds has gotten off to a fast start and would appear to have built an early lead on the scorecards against the man who is 66-0 coming in. Now you're boxing beauty, dude. How you feel, baby? Huh? You can come on with that. Come on, I'll take the I'll take the on the shoulders and on the arms. Do you understand? No. Okay. So you don't miss. You got me covered? Now just settle down. Settle down. Don't let the guy carry you too fast. You understand? Leave it up there. Put it right down. Put it right down. You're boxing beautiful out there. You got to throw punches and back this guy up now. I don't now want this guy stealing the rounds off of you here. Yes, you know, when you get nailed, come back. Mira, que lenta también. Eso es. Eso es. Él se olvida de subir la mano cuando te mete abajo. Keep your hands up. Throw the, throw the combinations down. Mira con todo. Well, Ray Leonard, would you say a near-perfect performance so far for Meldrick Taylor? It's a very good performance by Meldrick Taylor. He's been doing what he needs, needs to do. Boxing, just boxing, using speed. Chavez now bullying Taylor into the ropes. And maybe you see some frustration there. Chavez is getting hit a lot. The matter Chavez gets, the easier fight is going to be for Meldrick Taylor. And Taylor has gotten away with a lot of low blows. He's landed a bunch of them, and Richard Steele hasn't said a thing. Right hand lead by Chavez lands. Taylor comes back with an uppercut. We'll look to see if Chavez will follow his corner's orders and throw double left hooks. Chavez is looking for Meldrick Taylor's head. That's not an easy target. Chubb is fighting like a bull now, trying to just body Taylor off to make punching room. Taylor throwing punch after punch, though, to keep Chavez occupied. Chavez appears to be looking for one particular punch. You see Melger Taylor using both hands. The dilemma for Chavez, at least partially, is that it's hard to play offense when you're playing defense every second. Well, the hand speed of Mills Taylor is so blinding. The first thing that Chavez wants to do is block the shot. And in doing so, he doesn't retaliate. Chavez landed a glancing right hand inside. Taylor wasn't disturbed by it. Hard to get out. Again, Jim, this kind of fight, this inside fight, it wears the fighter down. And again, Taylor, I must stress, Taylor would do better going in and going out. I mean, although he's landing some pretty combinations, he would do better by getting his punches in and then backing away. Is he getting overconfident? Well, he's finally he's able to land so many punches. He's got them very, very comfortable in there. But he's doing a tremendous job, too. Is it possible, Ray, that he's getting a little tired to stay outside and that he's finding, trying to get rest in there? It's better for him to be on the outside, Larry, to get that breather. And within the last 30 seconds, Chavez has landed three solid left hooks inside. Taylor comes back with a bristling uppercut. And another flurry for Meldrick Taylor. This is the way Meldrick Taylor can steal the round. Throw those combinations before the bell ends.
Chavez boring in with a left and right, and Taylor begins to move again. And as round five comes to a close, Meldrick Taylor throws his glove skyward in celebration of his performance so far. We've lost this round. We cannot afford to lose any more rounds. Throw punches with him. Don't wait for him. Throw punches with him. You're better than him, Julio. You can't demonstrate nothing. You don't have to. Throw punches. Until he falls on his bottom. Don't wait, Julio. Throw punches. He's, he's inflating, Julio. Going one way or another. When you get inside now, you don't let him out of so you're on the inside now. You understand? Okay. Give him a little more circle right here. Give him a more circle. Look at the disparity hey, in punches circle. thrown. The sounded almost like desperation already in Chavez's corner. I don't know if I can read into their minds, but it seems to me they were saying, you're fighting his fight. You're trying to outbox him. You're trying to be a little too cute. You gotta go after him. Everyone expected the Taylor to get off to a fast start, the conventional wisdom of this fight. But it doesn't appear at this point that Chavez has done enough damage to Taylor to slow him down significantly in the second half of the fight. But there may have been a subtle trend, Larry, in the last minute of round five. Chavez landed three solid left hooks inside. If he can get that weapon going, it's the one which would be most likely to bring him back. Taylor is still exchanging to the body effectively. A trade punches inside, and Meldrick seemed to wobble for just a second. But now he comes back throwing. There's a slight swelling under the left eye of Meldrick Taylor. And every once in a while, we see a little trickle of blood out of Taylor's mouth. That doesn't seem to have bothered him. left, Eldrick misses with a right and a left. Chavez is not getting the kind of leverage he's used to getting against fighters when he can back them up against the ropes. He's never facing them with the speed of Melger Taylor, and the speed has definitely bothered the rhythm of Chavez. Chavez not throwing the type of body shots that he's known for. And in doing so, he's allowing Melger Taylor to get some of the combinations off two, three, four punches before he land one. Taylor moving better now than in round five, throwing the jab from greater distance. Right hand lead solid on the face of Chavez. Julio Cesar dropped his hand for a second. This is a masterful fight with Melvin Taylor. He's doing everything conceivable to offset Chavez. He's even closing the inside exchanges, and that was supposed to be Chavez's forte. Don't hold him, don't hold him. Chavez off balance, reaching in, uncharacteristic. Lunging with the right hand lead. Taylor beginning to dance and shuffle. And for the first time, Richard Steele tells Taylor to keep his punches up. But not before he'd landed about 20 low blows. In Chavez's corner, the last round, they said he's getting inflated, which I interpreted to mean he's getting a little full of himself, a little cocky. Well, off of that round, he had every reason to be cocky. Now, don't let him carry you too fast. Settle down a little bit. You got me coming? Now, you're, you're, you're coming back now. You're coming back. You're starting to feel good. Harold, we're halfway through this. How do you see it? Larry, I've got Meldrick Taylor winning the fight overwhelmingly. Six to nothing, 60 to 54 on points based on clean punching and ring generalship. Julio says that Chavez just can't seem to go to the right and cut off Meldrick Taylor when Taylor goes to the left and Taylor's out punching him and that's all there is to it. It's all Meldrick Taylor. I have Taylor pitching a shutout too so far, but somehow I doubt that the judges will see it quite that way. 
This is the part of the fight. They are all Chavez Nevada judges. Usually starts to take over. That's right. It is from this point on that he has done his most damage in the past. But tonight, Chavez, who normally lands upward of 50% of his punches, is down in the 30s. So he has not been as effective as he expects to be. Solid left hand by Meldrick Taylor. And Chavez showed you there his incredible ability to take a punch. He watched the life in the legs of Meldrick Taylor. Still a lot of bounce. And that gets back to the fact, Ray, that Chavez has not done damage to the body like he used to. He hurt done. Chavez just then. Chavez buckled. Chavez is damaged by the first minute of this round in which Taylor has landed at least three solid left hands. Chavez appears to be totally discombobulated right here. He's not throwing combinations. He's not throwing body shots. He's looking for that Come one shot to the head. Moment. I think at this moment he may just be trying to clear his head. I gotta brag a little bit, guys. I've been telling my friends for days that Meldrick Taylor would win the first six rounds of this fight. And I agree with you, Larry, and you, Harold. I think he has. Let's see if the rest of my prediction will come true. I don't feel that confident about that now. The way this fight is unfolding, it appears to me that if there is a knockout, it will be, and I've never said this, as far as uh, Taylor's concerned. You never dreamed before the fight you'd be saying Meldrick Taylor could knock him out, right? Because Taylor was the is the boxer, and yet he's out punching and outscoring Chavez. Well, his plan coming in was simply to win one round at a time and be totally happy with a 12-round decision. He would appear to be well on his way to that. Just to clarify, the rest of my prediction was that Chavez would turn it around in the second half of the fight and score a TKO in about the 11. Like I say, I don't know if I have much confidence in that right now. Taylor still blistering Chavez inside. Meldrick Taylor is getting his entire body behind his punches. He's not really known to be a big puncher, but here he's getting a lot of leverage behind the left hook of his. It's hard to imagine Taylor being more effective. Hard to imagine him doing a better job of rising to the biggest occasion of his career. When two guys stand toe-to-toe -to -toe like this and throws these kind of punches, normally one guy goes down. Because fatigue has definitely set in with both fighters. They've thrown a lot of punches. More so with Melger Taylor. Hunting it out. Solid left hook inside by Taylor. Chavez continues to try to come back with the left of the body. But he is not hurting Taylor. This would appear to be the deepest, darkest situation of Julio Cesar Chavez's long career. You saw them touch gloves after that round. There's great respect between them. He's cut. They want to put water, put water in his trunks. You've got to go out. He's not doing anything. Throw three punches. All right, let's watch some of Taylor's action here. Every good Philadelphia fighter I've ever seen has thrown great left hooks. And, Shav and Taylor is no exception. He can really throw the left hook. And the right ain't bad either. <laughs> and according to punch stat computations, Chavez's connect percentage was way down to 32%. He only threw 72 punches in the round, compared to 103 for Taylor, who connected on nearly half of them. Meldrick isn't just winning go, the fight. At this moment, he is dominating. Let's go. Let's go. I'm told they were 15 seconds late on the bell for the last round, and it lasted 3 minutes 15 seconds. That comes from our production truck. Keep him up, keep him up. Correct that, correct that. I am now told that the last round was the proper length of 3 minutes, but that the between rounds period was slightly longer up, than the normal 1 minute. So let's not 
say there have been any major irregularities or cast dispersions on the great professionals here in Las Vegas who control boxing and who sit next to me. Good overhand right by uh, Mildred Taylor. Taylor has controlled this entire fight, so what he needs to do is maintain that concentration and keep fighting this fight here. It's a perfect formula. There is swelling around both of Meldrick Taylor's eyes. And a cold compress was applied to what may be a small incipient cut under his left eye between rounds. Chavez landed a left. Taylor flurries furiously in return. And when have you seen Chavez at the end of an exchange like that moving backwards? Not very often. This is a whole new experience for Julio Cesar Chavez. A sign that I see here, Jim, is the fact that Chavez is not pressing the attack. He's more apt to move around. And Chavez does not fight this. This is not his fight. Which suggests that Taylor has driven him off. That More. he doesn't want to pay the price. A right and a left by Chavez, and more blood comes out of Taylor's mouth. Taylor begins to flurry with the left again. This is dramatic stuff. You're seeing a young fighter at the very top of his game against one of the greatest to have fought in the last 20 years. And if there was any doubt, Ray, as to whether Meldrick Taylor would fall prey to the pressure that you succumbed to in Montreal when you fought Roberto Duran's fight, it's been just the opposite. He is forcing Chavez to fight his fight. He is far more poised than I was for my fight with Duran back in 80. A lot of concentration here. Great left hook by Meldrick Taylor, and Chavez again backs up. Crowd chanting Mexico, Mexico, trying to lift Chavez up. I like to see those double left hooks thrown by Melvin Taylor. Throws them very, very well. Now there's something you never saw, Meldrick Taylor motioning Chavez to come to him. As if to say, come here, you're an easy target for me. <laughs> you're standing too straight up. Do it for your family. Give it all your heart. Let's go. You gotta put everything you've got. For the love of God, throw everything you've got, Julio. And there you see Taylor with his quicker hands. He beats Chavez to the punch and to the counter punch. They've gone to the whip very early in Chavez's corner. Yeah, when the cornermen start saying, for the love of God, they know how desperate the situation is. Taylor lands a right-hand lead to start the round off. Taylor went straight for Chavez. It's incumbent on Taylor not to give Chavez an unnecessary chance to get back into this. Look at the speed of Meldrick Taylor's flurry. Reminiscent of a young Ray Leonard. I love those combinations, Jim. He gets them in. It's so beautiful. He puts them together very well. And one thing those combinations do, it takes the crowd out of the fight for Chavez because from a distance you can't see if any or all of those punches have landed. They come so, mm -hmm. so many. So, so, <laughs> and very few of them are stopped or blocked by Chavez. Chavez still looking for that one big punch. He's just not getting a chance. He's standing in the middle of the ring where Taylor wants to fight. He hasn't been able to get him to the ropes, and he's being outpunched two or three to one. And still outpunched to the body as well. If you've just joined us, you're in the middle of the ninth round of a classic performance by a young fighter on the threshold of greatness. Meldrick Taylor coming into this bout, an underdog against the unbeaten Julio Cesar Chavez, has completely dominated Chavez with hand speed and vicious infighting. Taylor may well have won every round. You know what I see now, Jim, the fact that Taylor's coming out on top, fighting inside. 
and few expected that. He's done it with commitment, hand speed, superior strategy. I've seen more body shots thrown by Taylor than I have by Chavez. And the left hook to the body is supposed triple to be Chavez's hook. great weapon. Taylor landing at will with the left hook inside, Ray. It's a credit to Chavez's remarkable chin that he does not appear to have been wobbled. Blood now from Taylor's mouth and nose, but nothing is slowing him down. Chavez with a right hand that woke up the crowd for a second. Meldrick has answered everything like that in the bout. Savage left hook to the body by Taylor. And another. And what you see here again, Taylor's going through the body with two hands. He's been nothing short of great in that category. And finally, Richard Steele gives Taylor a serious warning about low blows. Look at slightly rejuvenated Chavez steps in and lands a right hand. Gentlemen, if Chavez was a champion and Taylor was a challenger, I would say right now that Chavez has to win his title back. Ahora sí, este es el hombre que yo quiero. Este es el peleador que yo quiero. Go for the opportunity. He is, he is uh, slowing down. Clean his face, he's putting Vaseline. For your family, Julio. Harold, we're three quarters of the way through this fight. Envelope, please. Larry, I've got it 90 to 81. Nine rounds to nothing in favor of Meldrick Taylor. Uh, he rounds five, seven, and nine. Meldrick stood on the inside and just fought, out fought uh, Chavez in his own game. And in the eighth round, he backed him up. I mean, I think it's all Meldrick Taylor. I think Julio has lost a lot of the snap to his punches. Let's go, Sergeant. Let's go. Let's go. It's a test of will as well as skill. I don't think either man's will has cracked yet. In every round so far, Taylor has thrown more punches, landed more, effectively dictated the strategy of the fight. I see here when Taylor's telling me that he can block the uh, left hook to the body with his arms. He's doing a good job of it. He's carried out George Benton's game plan to perfection. Whoa, beautiful combination. punches inside, and Chavez again seems to wobble slightly as Taylor lands at will. Brilliant stuff from Meldrick Taylor. Chavez on the verge of going down. Now he smiles as he slips a punch. Incredible fight by Meldrick Taylor. This man is in shape because the, the, the tempo of the fight and the combination he's been throwing. And Chavez, the great body puncher, is reduced to head hunting. Taylor has to watch out. I'm seeing him being hit by his left hooks. He needs to watch out for those shots. So I'm watching the effects of the punches. When Taylor lands a punch, Chav he, he rocks Chavez, but also Chavez is able to rock Taylor. Go home. Taylor beginning to look more the worse for wear than the action of the bout would have led you to believe, though. Blood again from the mouth and the nostrils. Watch Both the legs. beginning to close. Chavez is coming on. Watch the legs of Taylor. They all seem to be too steady here. Now this is normally, Jim, when, when Chavez goes to that combination to the body and to back to the head. Taylor again rocking back with two left hooks up, against the attack to the body. What a heart Taylor's shown tonight. Answering everything Chavez can throw with heavier stuff of his own. Crowd tries to become the third man in the ring. The arms of Taylor starting to go down now. He's starting to drop now. Both men have dispensed so much heart here. Chavez finally seizing the initiative for the first time. 
And for the first time, there's a mild air of danger from Eldrick Taylor. But he still comes back with flurries. Give him up, give him up. Right now, it's like who wants it the most? Well, you can never question Julio Cesar Chavez's desire. We see two real champions here tonight. The combination about both of them. Melvin Taylor, incredible. It, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that, guys. Angelo Dundee, the famous trainer, is here. He said to me earlier today that Chavez is the toughest fighter he has ever seen by none. And you can see just how tough he is if after those first nine rounds, he can come back at Taylor like this. Don't back off this guy too much because you get hit. You understand? Huh? You all right? Get a deep breath, man. This is that exchange earlier in the round, and Taylor landed two hard punches. Stiff left followed by a stiffer right. Major League stuff. Again in round 10, Taylor threw more punches, landed more punches. But Chavez shows a commitment which is rare and exclusive to great champions. What's going to be interesting in these next two rounds is to see how Taylor handles, handles this, because this is the toughest fight he's ever been in. Whether there's fatigue, whether he can stand up to this great champion who is just not going to give up. It's impossible to conceive that Chavez is in any way disillusioned about the necessity of a knockout. He's got to knock Taylor out to win this fight. Don't hold him. Watch your head. Keep him up. The best punch you tell is the left hook. Look at it, three, four left, left hooks at a time. The left hook, as Larry told you, a Philadelphia staple. Remember Joe Frazier? Watch your head! began his professional boxing career with as many or more consecutive wins than Julio Cesar Chavez. Right now, the 66 and 0 record, which was such a landmark in the history of the sport, the best in the last 78 years, is in serious jeopardy. As round 11 comes toward a close, Julio Cesar Chavez must begin to contemplate the reality that he's got three minutes in which to produce an unlikely knockout, or he will see his streak end before thousands of his countrymen. The impressive thing, he's still saying combination is thrown by Melger Taylor. Here in the, the 11th round, incredible. Two hard punches at the bell after a furious round like that. And Taylor was woozy and almost went to the wrong corner. He doesn't have a lot left, Larry. You've got to go for this round. When the bell rings, you've got to go. Throw your punches. 
You're stronger than he is, champ. You're more than he is. Seconds out! Seconds out! Harold, how do you have it? Larry, 9-2, 108-101, Meldrick Taylor. I think he's on his way to a unanimous decision. If you're a fight fan, get ready for three minutes of high drama now as a desperate and determined Julio Cesar Chavez tries to take out a fading and battered Meldrick Taylor who has completely dominated him through most of the fight. Both of Taylor's eyes are closing. The blood continues to flow from his nose and his mouth. But if he stands up, he wins. And here's, he's a warrior. Look at him. He's trying to stay there and trying to apparently push Chavez out. Play it safe and box. Meldrick Taylor said before the fight, he'll take me to a higher place. He's and there he right has. now. He's there right now, Larry. No question about it. Well said. How to get out? That is a tired Meldrick Taylor slipping to the canvas. Two minutes to go. Maybe two minutes left in Julio Cesar Chavez's historic unbeaten streak. You would expect the aggression to be with Chavez. It's more so with Taylor. He's found like he's behind on points. Well, they're both tired. Watch your head. But you're right, Ray. It doesn't appear at this moment that Chavez has the stuff to get it done. More pawing than punching now at a time when he needs the best. Another solid left hook from Meldrick Taylor. regarded by most as the best referee in the sport. He has really put himself on the line. Harold Letterman, your response. Jim, the last round is the only round that you can be saved by the bell. 
okay? But the referee obviously doesn't know how much time is left in a round. That's right. Had not Steele stopped the fight, it, it's very likely that Melton no Taylor may have won a decision. But the last round is the only round in which you can be saved by the bell. Very, very interesting. So if Richard Steele didn't stop the fight, Chavez would never have thrown another punch. Had the judges had Taylor ahead on the scorecards, as we did, Taylor would have won the decision. Very interesting. There's very little question of that, Harold, unless they were watching an entirely different fight. Here's another look. It was a solid right hand thrown by Chavez, his, his desperation punch, if you will, because throughout the whole fight, no Taylor fought an impressive fight. The left hook set, up, set him up for the right hand. And Meldrick trying to hold himself up, get hit by a solid right hand, and goes through the canvas. Now, here's where Steele makes a critical decision. Taylor was up. My memory tells me by the count of four, Ray. I think it was five. He was up. You're right, it was five, seven, seven eight, 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 nine. nine. Now he looks at him, are you okay? Is and he, stops the fight. You notice Meldrick's looking at his corner. For instructions. He couldn't answer Steele when Steele asked him if he was okay. Is that what's critical, Harold? That, that's the point. Melvin Taylor did not respond, and that's very, very obvious. And when you're the referee, if the guy doesn't respond, you have no choice but to stop the fight because Meldrick Taylor could have been very, very seriously hurt. Therefore, Richard Steele made the right call without question. That is Steele's criterion here. Exactly. If you see it again. Taylor looked at him, but didn't say a word, and then looked away. Right. He didn't respond to Steele's question when Steele said, are you all right? There's no doubt that Richard did the right thing. The man could have been seriously hurt. It's a shame that it had to happen, but I agree 100% with the referee in this case. All right, I think Larry Merchant may be ready to talk to Richard Steele. They're standing in front of a camera right now, and Larry's nodding at me, and yeah, let's go. Larry with Richard Steele. All right, I'm with Richard Steele, the referee. Richard, you describe the end of the fight and why you stopped it. Well, Larry, I stopped it because, you know, Melger had took a lot of good shots, a lot of hard shots, and it was time for it to stop. I didn't, you know, I'm not the timekeeper. I don't care about the time. When I see a man that has enough, I'm stopping the fight. When you, did, you, did you ask him a question? Did you ask him what his name was, where he was? Could you, anything to find out? whether he could have gone on, which turned out to be another two seconds in the fight? No, I didn't ask him a question. I asked him, was he all right? And he, I didn't hear him say a thing, but I was looking at his condition mainly. That's what I was interested in. Given the stakes of the fight, given the tide of the fight, should you have looked back and seen where Chavez was? Should you have given this man in, in a fight this big a chance to survive? There's no fight worth a man's life. I don't care what it is or how many I do. When I get tired of seeing a guy getting bound, pound, pound, and I think he had enough, I'm going to stop him. Thank you very much, Richard. Now back to you, Jim. And right now, let's go to ring announcer Chuck Hall for the official particulars. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Richard Steele stops the bout at two minutes. 58 seconds of the 12th round. The winner and now holder of both the WBC and IBF 140 pound championships from Culiacan, Mexico, Julio Cesar Chavez. And there's a look at Chavez and Larry Merchant is with him. All right, Julio, give us your idea of what happened at the end of the fight. Dale la idea que tú tienes de la pelea de de la última parte de la pelea. Lo que piensas tú. Bueno, realmente me sentí cansado, la verdad. Sinceramente. He felt really tired. I felt very, very tired to be Por real. Mi pelea, Melvin Taylor es un gran peleador. Melvin's a great fighter. Es un peleador muy rápido e inteligente. Very, very intelligent fighter and very quick fighter. Se merece una otra oportunidad. He deserves another shot. Did you think you were losing the fight and would lose it unless you knocked him out at, in the ninth, 12th round? Si tú crees que estabas perdiendo la pelea y la única manera de ganar era por knockout. No, yo sabía que la pelea estaba muy pareja, cualquiera podía ganar. I think that he thinks the fight was still a close fight. What was so difficult about fighting him? ¿Qué era lo más dificultoso de pelear a él? 
es un, pele es un peleador rápido, inteligente, le tiras un golpe y te pega tres golpes. He says a very intelligent fighter, very quick fighter. He'll throw three punches and he'll throw one punch and he throws three punches back. Julio, is that the toughest fight of your life? Is he the best fighter you ever fought? Yes, he's one of the toughest fighters. And and you think definitely that there should be a rematch? Yeah. Thank you very much, Julio. Great fight, great comeback. Julio, okay, put a camera. Jim. All right, thank you very much, Larry. And just to set the record straight about what was at stake when Richard Steele made the call to stop the fight, our information from the Nevada State Athletic Commission is that Meldrick Taylor would have won a split, not a unanimous, but a split decision. One of the judges had Chavez ahead but two others had Meldrick Taylor winning the fight. So Richard Steele, in effect, prevented Meldrick Taylor from winning a split decision by stopping the fight when he did. Harold Letterman has already offered his opinion, Ray, that it was an entirely justifiable decision. What do you think? It's a horrible scenario because he was just two seconds away from winning or unifying the uh, division. And uh, I think that with uh, Richard Steele, the referee, he's a very competent referee, and he was doing what he felt was in the best interest of the fighter. Uh, there's not too much more that needs to be said, Jim. Let's give credit to Chavez for what has to be seen as another of his long string of incredibly willful and courageous performances. He had to come up with something in the last minute of the fight, and he did. Well, it was a complete shutout up until like two seconds before the round was over. And Melcher Taylor fought the most perfect fight I've seen in boxing. Tactical, strategic, he did what he had to do to really nullify Chavez. This defeat will do nothing to diminish the reputation of the great Meldrick Taylor. And Larry Merchant is with him right now. All right, Meldrick, give us your version of what happened at the end. Did you get any kind of signal from the referee asking you how you were? Do you think you could have gone on? The fight was two seconds in the 12th round. There's no one in the world in the hell that he should have stopped this fight. Me leading on, on the scorecards going into the last round. I got hit with a, corp, a good punch. I went down. Here, let's stay in here. Got you, got, a, you got hurt by a right hand. Describe the rest of us. But I got here. I was exchanging. I should have stayed away from him because I was leading. He caught me with a lucky punch right there. Combinations. And I basically sort of closed the gap in between. He caught me with a good right hand. Okay, I took the shot. And I got up. He didn't say anything to me. He didn't say, are you okay? Count. count. He didn't give me no kind of directions in the corner. And he just stopped the fight. Could, I looked could, at him. See, he's counting. All right. He was all right. Yeah, you, he's still look, he's got his head out of line. You said I'm okay. He's you're, felt, his head out of you're telling him you're okay. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. He look at that. He's not on his head out. You're all right. right. I'm right at Chavez and say I'm okay, I'm okay. Then he just stops. All right, Lou Duver, manager and co-trainer. Lou, what was your view of that? Should he have stopped the fight? He says, I don't know what time it is. All I know is I've got a hurt fighter in front of me. I don't want him to get hit anymore. Bullshit. I don't believe that there. He got up. He he started to pick up the count. At 6, he got up. And he kept talking to him. And he to and you'll see him. Look at the photo again. And you'll see Melrick nodding at him. And he was OK. And forget about it. He didn't know the time. I they got to give the guy a chance. It's a title fight. He wasn't getting hurt out there. You're, 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 you're saying, Lou, that the referee should, in a fight of this magnitude, somehow take that in consideration, especially Absolutely. what's going on up till now. Absolutely. The fight was a great fight. Both fighters were great out there. Let the fighter fight out there. He must have had some semblance of how long it had to go on there. But the kid, the kid got up. He got up at six, and he counted six. Take a look at the photo, and you'll see it at six, Larry. It wasn't at nine. It wasn't at ten. It was at six. He was up, and he was looking at the referee. Let's see if we can take another take look at that. Uh, back follows and back in the truck. Right. Here now it watch is. Watch when he gets up. Watch when he gets up. Now watch, 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 watch what the count is when he gets up. Now watch his fingers. See his fingers? Now it's seven. See it? Now it's eight. Now it's nine. Right? Okay, he's looking at him. Now he's not stopping the fight. We're not even giving him a chance. Come on, for Christ's sake. That's baloney. Did you, did you think you were ahead in that fight? And why were you successful up until that moment? Well, I know I was ahead because I was throwing a lot more uh, cleaning shots, a lot more flurries. And leading to the last round, I got a little careless. His training his punches and stuff, should have stayed away with the jab. But still, you know, the fight was that good that it should have went to 12 rounds and 
it was just premature that he stopped the fight like that, you know, of his magnitude, you know. Let, just let me get this straight one last time. When you were up, and you were up at about the count of five, actually, because it was when he counted six, he was looking straight in your face. Did you try to signal him in any way, I'm okay, or did you just assume that you were going to go on and finish the round? I know I didn't see you, I'm okay. Then he looked at me and waved his hands. I couldn't believe it. I believe he was stopping the fight. You'll see him nodding out there, Larry. If you look at that, you'll All see right. him nodding when he's over there. At the count of six, he's nodding at Chavez him. congratulated you on a great fight, and almost the first words out of his mouth was, he deserves a rematch. Do you want a rematch? I most definitely want a rematch, because uh, this fight should have been mine. This should have been in the basket. I had leaned in on the scorecards, and then it was premature that Richard Steele would do something like this and um, start the fight under this false pretense like this with only a few seconds left in a trial fight of this magnitude. And I had a clear conscience. I got up the count of six, okay? And I grabbed the rope just to keep keep my balance. And it count of eight, nine, ten, I looked at him with nine minutes, I'm ready. And then he just stopped the fight. He was ready to go out there, Larry. I don't understand it, Larry. Thank you very much, Meldrick and Lou. Back to you, Jim and Ray. All right, thank you very much, Larry, and brilliantly done. You heard the talk there, Ray Leonard, about <coughs> a potential rematch. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion as to what can happen in the future to either one of these fighters, perhaps moving up to welterweight to fight a Marlon Starling, perhaps going back down to lightweight to fight a Pernell Whitaker, uh, or most likely meeting each other. And let's campaign right now. I want to see it again. You want to see it again? Big time. I want to see it again. <laughs> what will this do to the frame of mind of a Meldrick Taylor, who fought about as brilliantly as he could have been expected to fight and wound up losing on uh, a knockout in the last 10 seconds of the fight. Is it going to discourage him and set him back, or is it going to give him more incentive to increase his greatness? Viewing Melcher Taylor tonight, I'm led to believe that he's going to be even greater, even faster, stronger, and even more confident, because this kind of fight here only makes a fighter better. After what happened to Chavez tonight and the punishment he took through these 12 rounds, what could he do to turn the tables and come out and be more effective against Taylor the next time? You know, they say Styles make fights, but then again, Melja Taylor made the fight. He did his thing. He outpunched uh, Chavez, he outscored him, he threw him body shots. He was doing everything that normally Chavez would do. I'm very impressed. I tell you, I'm very impressed with Melja Taylor. All right, thanks very much, Ray. It was a brilliant bout. We're going to be talking about it for a long time. Larry Merchant, you've seen a lot of things in boxing, but this one writes another new chapter. Who gets the credit? Who gets the blame? Well, first I want to say, uh, is this just the start of the 90s? I, I don't know if I could stand this anymore between Tyson and Douglas and Chavez and Taylor. Earlier I tried to say in any number of ways how tough a man Julio Cesar Chavez is. I told you how Angelo Dundee said he was the toughest fighter he'd ever seen. I said, tougher than LaMotta, tougher than Marciano, tougher than Fraser. He said, the toughest I've ever seen. After all the punches he took in this fight, to still be able to find somewhere in the depths of him the strength and the will to finish that fight that way, even if Richard Steele had allowed it to go on and if Taylor had won the fight, is simply amazing. I think Richard Taylor, Richard Steele, made a mistake. I think that in an event of this magnitude, you cannot dismiss what has gone on in the past. You have to have some sense of where that round is. I believe that Taylor could have endured. I think it was an injustice to him. No discredit to Chavez at all. I just think it was a mistake. Referees sometimes make mistakes, just as fighters do, and a big one. And just as we had a controversy that was a bogus controversy in Tokyo. I think this is a real controversy, but the winner is still the winner. But this is a controversy which is going to build and kindle rather than diminish interest in a sport which you have so accurately called the theater of the unexpected and which was once again the theater of the unexpected here. We're going to see a rematch of this as soon as both fighters can get ready to do it and make the deal, I think. You know, at the top of the show, I said how we were expecting a four-star banquet. And along about the middle of the fight and into the eighth and ninth rounds, it seemed to me, well, we are seeing two great athletes really give everything they have and, and show us technique and courage, but it lacked the drama. 
but boy, by the end of it, I guess we've now got a, about a five-star banquet. Yeah, no question about it, indeed. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Ray. It was a privilege, as always, to work with the two of you. And as Larry suggested, sometimes you get a chance to build up huge expectations for an event, and the event not only lives up to those expectations, but surpasses them. Those are the moments in sports which are longest remembered. We expected, we asked for, we promoted a great fight here tonight. We saw a brilliant performance by Meldrick Taylor, which ended in defeat. We saw a less effective performance than usual from Julio Cesar Chavez, which ended in the 67th victory of his so far unbeaten career. It was chapter one, and only chapter one, of a drama which promises to play into future chapters. Two minutes, 58 seconds of round number 12. Meldrick Taylor's demise at the hands of Julio Cesar Chavez. To be continued. Stay tuned immediately following HBO's World Championship boxing coverage for One Night Stand, Charles Fleischer on the East Coast and Lean On Me on the West Coast. And be sure to join us April 14 when HBO Sports will present an IBF middleweight championship fight as Michael Nunn defends his title against the WBC welterweight champion, Marlon Starling. So now for Larry Merchant and Sugar Ray Leonard, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Las Vegas. The executive producer of HBO Sports is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's fight was produced by Rick Bernstein and directed by Mark Payton. The feature producers were David Harmon and Brian McDonald, the replay producer Michael J. Whalen, the assistants to the producer Kendall Reed and Kirby Bradley, the production manager Russell Gabay, and the technical supervisor was George Wenzel.